The king is dead. Long live the king. King is dead. Long live the king. That was the headline this past Monday, a headline that caught my attention for its wording for a couple of reasons. First off, if you had been paying attention to the news and you have any uh, understanding of the golf world, there is one in Arnold Palmer who was called the king of golf who passed away on Sunday, September 25, 87 years old. Um, and as one who has always been a fan of golf, I remember as a, a young boy, even when he was kind of in his heyday at that time, um, always sad to see those types of things happen in our world. Uh, we recognize that every single day there are literally hundreds and thousands of people who pass away, but on occasion there are names that stand out that we all know, and it kind of uh, makes us stop and think where maybe we don't other than that. Um, but that headline, the king is dead, long live the king. For Arnold Palmer, obviously it was an announcement that he as the king of golf had died. But long live the king. Asking maybe that his legacy would live on, that he would be remembered. Certainly long live the king as Arnold Palmer on this earth isn't going to happen. But that headline intrigued me for another reason, because when I hear the word the king, my mind goes to another king. Does yours? And so I thought about that headline, the king is dead, long live the king, because it almost seems to fit better than anyone else, Jesus. Because we know Jesus died, the king is dead, but Jesus is what? Alive, long live the king. And so I began to take a look at that phrase, that headline. And history would tell us that it was not unique to September 26, 2016, nor Arnold Palmer, because history would tell us that that headline or that phrase, those words, were first used some 600 years ago in the country of France. King Charles VI had passed away, and immediately upon his death, his son Charles, who would become King Charles VII, was enthroned as the king of France. And thus the saying came about, the king is dead, while at the very same time, Long live the new king. May he have a long and prosperous reign. But history doesn't always consider all of the history books that we have. Because there is another book in which that phrase, that sentiment, is spoken very clearly. It's one that I hope all of you brought with you today. And if you did, I would invite you to turn with me to Psalm 72. If you didn't, there is a Bible in front of you, and you can use that as well. And we're going to go to, again, Psalm chapter 72. And we are going to spend our time in this chapter today, so you'll want to mark it there, and we will be coming back to it. If you are using your pew Bible, that's page 574. Psalm chapter 72. Now, as we begin, uh, many Bibles, as you get to the heading of a new chapter, will have a little subtitle over the chapter telling us a little something about the chapter. What does your Bible say of Psalm chapter 72? A Psalm of Solomon. So that would give us a hint that who wrote this? Oh, we would think it was Solomon because it says of Solomon. But some of your Bibles, if they have been paying attention when they were putting their headings on, will probably say, for Solomon. And that is the correct wording that should be on there. And how do we know that? Well, look with me to Psalm chapter 72 and go to the very last verse of that chapter, Psalm 72 and verse 20. 
Psalm 72, 20 says this, speaking of what we have just read in Psalm 72, concludes the prayer of who? Of David, the son of Jesse. So what we find here is that David was writing this psalm for his son Solomon. And it just so happens, as we read there, this concludes, Bible scholars will tell us that this is likely the very last words that David wrote, literally on his deathbed. The king soon would be what? Dead. And his message would be long live who? The king. And as we read the heading, we just assume that it's going to be Solomon. Were you paying attention to the scripture reading today? I hope so. As I've said before, we don't have the scripture reading so we can insert two minutes into the service so we can get all the way to the end time. It's there for a purpose, even though Jeremy didn't even know that. But if you were listening, if you were reading along, you understood there that it says David was actually a prophet. He would die. He was in his tomb as Peter was preaching this sermon at Pentecost. But even though he was in his tomb, David prophetically had looked forward to the coming of who? Jesus, the king of all kings. And as we look at Psalm chapter 72, it's almost as if David on his deathbed was, yes, looking ahead to his son Solomon, praying a prayer for his reign that it would be indeed long and prosperous, long live King Solomon. And yet when we read it carefully, we get a sense that David understood something, that even the greatest reign And the greatest king on this earth could not fulfill what he was desirous of in his heart. And his heart and mind were taken beyond that of his son Solomon to a king who would indeed take David's throne and would be the king that would fulfill everything that Israel wanted and needed. I want to read you just a couple of quotations here. First from Barnes's notes on the Old Testament. His commentary says that this was composed by David in view of the anticipated glories and the peaceful reign of his son and successor, speaking of Solomon, as an inspired production indicating what that reign would be and looking onward to still a more glorious and peaceful reign of the Messiah as king. In the Adventist Bible commentary, it breathes the spirit of David's last words. Glorious are the promises made to David and his house, promises that look forward to the eternal ages and find their complete fulfillment in Jesus Christ. In other words, as David is there on his deathbed, he is looking at the reign to come of his son, but he realizes that all of the promises that God has made for Israel, all of the hope that they have, could never be filled in the reign of his son. There was only one place that they could be filled, one king that could truly fulfill them, and that is who? Is Jesus. And so as we look at Psalm chapter 72 today, we do so understanding that David is praying for, ultimately, the reign of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ himself. And with that in mind, let's go to Psalm 72 here. And we want to look at verse 1 and then a few others that will go along with that to begin with. Psalm 72 and verse 1. It says, endow the king with your what? With your justice, O God, the royal son, with your righteousness. Remembering again that this is a prayer of David. The New Living Translation, which by the way, when you read through the book of Psalms, 
is a wonderful translation to read it out of. Just some beautiful wording that it uses. But in the New Living Translation here, it basically says that David is praying that this king to come would love justice in the same way as God loves justice. Isn't that neat? David's prayer for the coming king, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would be that this Jesus would be filled with a love of justice just as God was. Look with me down at a couple other verses here that talk about this. Verse 4 of Psalm 72. It says, He, speaking of this King Jesus to come, He will defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy, and He will crush the oppressor. Does that sound like good news? A justice that was coming that would be good? It does, doesn't it? Then skip down to verses 12 through 14. Same chapter and verses 12 through 14. For he, again speaking of the king to come, will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy. He will save them, save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Do you know you're precious in the sight of Jesus today? A prayer that Jesus would be a king of justice. Keep your finger or bulletin or something in Psalm 72, because again, we will come back to it. But look with me over to Isaiah chapter 11 and verses 3 and 4. Isaiah prophesying here is going to confirm the prayer of David. Isaiah chapter 11 and verses 3 and 4, page 686 in your pew Bible there. Isaiah chapter 11 and verses 3 and 4. It says there, And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions. Now, again, I just want to read this out of the New Living Translation because the wording here is very, very important for us to grasp here. Uh, New Living Translation, Isaiah eleven three to 4, He will delight in obeying the Lord. Remember, David's prayer was to give this king a heart of justice just like who? Like God had. And Isaiah picks this up. He says, this king is going to delight in obeying who? In obeying God. Did you know Jesus obeyed? He was faithful, wasn't he? A faithful in obedience to God. So he will delight in obeying the Lord. And then listen to how this puts Isaiah's words. He will not judge by appearance, nor will he make a decision based on hearsay. Is that contrary to what we experience in our world sometimes? And how perhaps you mete out justice in your own life? How many of you have ever made a judgment based on a first look? Based on what someone else has told you about someone? It's easy to do, isn't it? David's prayer was that God would send a king who truly practiced real justice. Isaiah says this king will be one who doesn't just judge by the outward appearance. And David would know this, wouldn't he? But the Lord looketh where? On the heart. Not going to judge by what he hears about someone, but what he knows is in their hearts. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. Well, was that who Jesus, the King of Kings, really was? Have you ever questioned God and His justice before in your life? Have you ever really just stopped and thought, you know what, God, this just doesn't seem what? Fair. I'm sure one or two of us have probably done that along the way. Sometimes, perhaps, we even question the very existence 
of this King Jesus because of circumstances that are happening in our lives. Have you ever come to the place where difficulties and trials are such that you wonder if God is even really what? Even really there. Well, don't feel bad if you have. And if you say you haven't, perhaps when I read the next verses, you might think differently. Turn in your Bibles with me now to Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to look at verses 2 down through around verse 5. Matthew chapter 11, and beginning in verse 2, page 965, Matthew chapter 11, and verse 2. Speaking of John the Baptist, he would have been at our Wednesday night prayer meeting over at Claire and Linda's. This is a verse or a set of verses we ran read towards the end of the study. And notice what John is experiencing here. When John heard in prison, verse 2, what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? What was John dealing with? He had doubt and question, didn't he? In his own life, in his own heart, this forerunner of Christ, the very one who was called by God to prepare the way for the Messiah, in prison here as he is looking and hearing about what Jesus is doing, he comes to this conclusion, wait a minute, is this really who God told me to come and proclaim? Are you really the Messiah. So the disciples go and ask that question of Jesus. Verse 4, Jesus' reply, Jesus said, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. I want to think about that last part. What is being preached? The good news. Now, Jesus' answer is important here because in his answer, he is giving John's disciples an answer that includes everything that the Old Testament said the Messiah would do when he was here. Go and tell John everything that you see and hear. But I want to highlight that last part. Jesus emphasizes the fact that he is preaching the what? The gospel. Is it important that there is a gospel message to go along with the healing of the blind, the helping out of the poor, and all of those other things that Jesus was doing? Is the gospel important on top of those things? Very much so. Let me illustrate it this way. A long time ago in an ancient village, there was a neighboring village that came and took over that village for no reason. It was totally unprovoked. And they took from that village all of the leading men and warriors and took them back to their village and put them in prison. And everybody thought that was very, very unfair because they had done nothing to deserve this. Well, left in the village that had been taken were four very wealthy men. And when they heard of the condition of those fellow townsmates that were in prison there, they decided to do something about it. One of the problems in the prison was there was no drinking water that was really fit to drink. So the first wealthy man went to that city, that village, and said, I want to give you enough money that you can provide for all of the prisoners water that is suitable to drink. They were more than happy to take his money, and they provided good water for them to drink, and the man went away feeling that he had accomplished something good. And had he? He had, hadn't he? A second man looked at the fact that they were in prison there in some of the conditions and found out that they had no bedding, nowhere to sleep, that they just had to lay at night on the cold rock floor of their cells. He took his money and he said, I will pay for everyone to have bedding and pillows so they will have a place to sleep. Again, they were more than happy to take their money 
and it provided them a good place to sleep. Their conditions were much better. That man left feeling like he had accomplished something good, and had he? He had. Not only now could they drink fresh water, but they had a good place to sleep. The third man found out that the food that they were being given was far from being nutritious enough to sustain them, and being a wealthy farmer, he went and asked for the privilege of paying for the right to bring some of his produce to feed those who were in the prison. And again, they gladly took his money, and he provided the food, and the men now had good, nutritious food to eat. And the man left feeling like he had accomplished something good. And had he? He most definitely had. Good food to eat, beds to sleep in, water was good to drink. Everything was much better than it had been. The fourth rich man understood that even all, even though all of these things were better, justice really hadn't been served. Because these innocent men were still where? In prison. They may have been living better in prison, but they were still in prison. And so he took all of his money and figured out a way of buying a key that opened up the doors of the prison. And in the middle of one night, he found his way into the prison and unlocked the doors and the prisoners were set free. Now who had really given justice to those who were wrongly in prison? The other ones made it better for them in their situation, but only one gave them freedom. David's prayer for this coming king is that he would be a king of justice. And understand, Jesus could have come down here and healed all the sick people, made all the poor people have what they need, and just called it good at that, and he would have made life better on this earth. Would he not have? But would it have really been justice? No, and that's what the good news of the gospel does for us, doesn't it? Because not only did Jesus make our lives better here, but he also freed us from the captivity and slavery that all of us are in to sin. And he was indeed a just king, was he not? And he did this in his what? Where do we really find the full justice of what Jesus did for us? We find it in one place, don't we? On Calvary, on a cross, where it could have been proclaimed that the king was what? Was dead. And yet today, we know differently, don't we? Because the king is still very much what? Alive. And as David prayed that this would not just be some short-term kingdom, <clears throat> this would be a kingdom where justice would be found for how long? Forever. And today you and I still live in the justice of the king of kings. One who indeed is an answer to David's prayer because he loves justice, Jesus does, just as his Father in heaven. Back to Psalm chapter 72 and looking at verse 2. It says, He will judge your people in righteousness. Not only is he going to be a king that gives justice, but this king is going to have the right and authority to do what? says here to judge. And David's prayer is that he would be what kind of a judge? A righteous judge. In your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 5, and we want to look at verses 22 to 27. John chapter 5 and verses 22 to 27. Again, sometimes I am amazed at how God 
works over the course of even a, a week when you're putting sermons together because they are our Bible study again over at Claire and Linda's on Wednesday night. These are some words that we read and, and talked about for quite some time. John chapter 5 and verses 22 to 27, page 1055 in your pew Bible there, or 54. John 5, beginning in verse 22, Moreover, the Father judges how many? No one. But has entrusted all judgment to who? To the Son. This is the one David is praying for. That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth, and listen carefully to verse 24. This is a powerful verse. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has what? Eternal life. Is that good? Yeah, if we believe on the name of Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. That is justice, isn't it? But it goes on to say, and will not be condemned... Some translations will say to face the judgment there instead of condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth, verse 25, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Just a little backwards run into our lesson study today. You remember Job 14, 14, and 15? David's prayer there as he's thinking about the fact in all of his misery that certainly he is going to die, but he says, even though that might happen, one day God is going to call and I'm going to what? I'm going to answer. What was he saying? There's a time coming, even if this life is taken away from us, when God is going to call us forth from death. And if we are in Christ Jesus, whose voice will we hear? We'll hear Jesus' voice. And are you going to answer? I know if that's where I am, I'm going to answer. Because I really don't want to be there. I want to be with him. And that's what it's saying here. Those who hear his voice will live. For as the Father has life in himself, verse 26, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to do what? To judge. And why has he given him that authority? Because he is the Son of God. Because he is the Son of God. This is why God gave him the authority to be the righteous judge that David was praying for. Um, Desire of Ages, and this is what we read the other night. A wonderful quotation here. And God hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Because he has tasted the very dregs of human affliction and temptation, and he understands the frailties and the sins of men. Because in our behalf he has victoriously withstood the temptations of Satan, and will deal justly and tenderly with the souls that his own blood has been poured out to save. Because of this the Son of Man is appointed to execute judgment. And that day Jesus declared, He that heareth my word and believeth him that sent me hath eternal life and cometh not into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Jesus is given that authority to be judged because he is the Son of God, because he came to this earth and experienced everything in this life that you will have to face. He is not one who is unfamiliar with the things that we have faced, including all of our trials and temptations and the sorrows and the sufferings that we go through. We have one who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses and yet did it without what? Sin. And because he is the Son of God, he has been given authority to be your judge. I want to go back to just something very quick here in what the Bible teaches in John chapter 5. If we are in Christ Jesus, we don't have to face condemnation, or as the revised version said there in the Desire of Ages, we don't have to pass through the what? The judgment. Does that sound like good news to you? 
that you don't have to be in the judgment of God. You don't have to stand in condemnation. I heard a few people that were somewhat excited about that, but you should all be excited about that because without Jesus, every one of you and me, or me and you, because I would probably stand first, are facing eternal death. The wages of sin is what? Eternal death, not just a death you die on this earth with a hope of something better to come, but a death that has no hope of anything more than what you had in this life. That is what you have earned. The wages of your life have earned and deserve nothing more than eternal death. And so understanding that, I am very excited and happy to say today that I don't have to stand in judgment before God for who I am and what I have done. I don't have to face the wrath and the condemnation of God, the penalty that I truly deserve. Are you not thankful for that? And the reason we don't is because who stands in your place? Jesus, who also happens to be the one who is going to judge you. But it is Jesus and his righteousness that stands in your place. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. I know I have read a verse in the Bible that says somewhere that we all must stand before the judgment seat of who? God. And it's true. Every one of us does. But if we have chosen Jesus, there is one who is going to come and take our place. So we don't have to face the judgment that is there. And that's good news. Well, wait a minute, Pastor, there's more. You're missing another verse because there's some place in Scripture, I know I've read it somewhere before, that says we are all going to be judged by the things that we have what? We have done. And so we know since the things we have done don't save us, our next best theology is the good things that we do then are judged as evidence that we really love who? Jesus, the good things that I do are evidence that I've really accepted who? Jesus. Is that how you want to stand before God? Not me. Because there's going to be somebody else there. And if I go up and say, here's the evidence, God, all of these good things I've done, this proves that I really do know you and I've accepted you as my Savior, there's going to be one that will be able to point out all the bad things I've done. And that should be evidence that I really haven't, what? Evidently, I really haven't. If the good proves that I have, the bad certainly could be just as much evidence that I haven't accepted Jesus. I don't want to be involved in that game. Because at the end of the day, when I put really everything that God knows about my innermost being, the very thoughts that I've had, not just the things I've done, the thoughts that I've had that almost equate to things that I've done, when I stack all of that up against the good that I've done in my life, it's not going to be very even on the scales. I suspect that my bad outweighs the good. And if my actions are evidence of whether I've really accepted Jesus or not, then I'm back into a very serious place. But the promise of Jesus says here, as judge, if you believe in me, I am standing in your place. You don't have to worry about proving anything. The most important work that you are responsible for in your salvation is believing in who? In Jesus Christ, period, end of story. Anything beyond that has nothing to do whether you're in his kingdom or not, nothing to do whether proving you belong there or not. Because if you want to go that route, that's fine, but I'm giving you some advice now. Don't try it. And so David's prayer was for a righteous judge. And his prayer is answered in who? It's answered in Jesus, isn't it? It is answered in Jesus, who is willing to stand in our place. 
that we don't have to. And I will take Jesus' righteousness every single time. And don't let anyone deceive you with theology that says you somehow have to prove your decision. It's not what Jesus is about, and that's not how you're going to be judged. Because he's a righteous judge, he's not a judge like you and I would be. And then lastly, as we go back to Psalm 72, and again, if we look at what we just talked about, the fact that Jesus is our righteous judge, where did he truly gain the authority to be our righteous judge? Same place, wasn't it? It was on the cross. A place where one could have said the king is dead, but God tells us otherwise, doesn't he? The king is alive and well. And because he is living, because he is the son of God, I have given him the authority to be your judge. And we praise God for that. Verse 15 in Psalm 72. And again, I'm just going to, what does your Bible say in the first line of verse 15? Some say, long may he live. I like the New Living Translation here because it says, long live the king. David, in looking forward to the Messiah, when he said, long live the king, he wasn't just talking about a long and prosperous reign here on this earth. He was looking beyond this earth, wasn't he? He was looking to eternity. And so when he says this, long live the king, he is talking about more than any other kingdom on this earth has ever experienced. 15 down through verse 20. Long live the king. May gold from Sheba be given him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. Let grain abound throughout the land. On the tops of the hills may it sway. Let its fruit flourish like Lebanon. Let it thrive like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. All nations will be blessed through him and they will call him blessed. Praise be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. And then I like the way David ends it here. Amen and what? Amen. Now when things happen that are good after special music today, a few of you said amen. But if it's really super good, you should have done what? Amen and amen. And Mateo and Lucas might have got an amen, amen, and an amen this morning. That was awesome. But David here is telling us something. Amen and amen means he is very serious about what he's saying. Amen means so be it. His prayer for the king would be that the Messiah, the king to come in Jesus Christ, that his kingdom would be one that lasted for what? forever and it would flourish forever and those who are a part of his kingdom would flourish for eternity and David as he looks forward to this he gives it an amen and an amen because this is truly the desire of his heart and his prayer for the king to come in Jesus Christ back in 1924 in Russia Vladimir Lenin died those that were put in charge of his body were told to embalm him, and he was to lay in state for several days that whoever from the country of Russia, the nation of Russia, could come and pay their respects. But as those days, two or three days went by, they began to think about who this man was and what he represented in the kingdom of Russia. And the thought process is what he had established, they never wanted it to what? To end. And so they came up with an idea. I would say ingenious, but it just isn't that. But they figured out a way to preserve Lenin's body so that it would always be there. And indeed, today, you can go to Russia, and you can go to Lenin's tomb, and there, within an englassed 
are in closed glass case, you can see the former ruler of Russia. Now almost nearly a hundred years later. And he has been there since, outside of a couple wars where they took his body away so it wouldn't be destroyed. And then for about a month a year, they go and dip him into a bunch of different acids and solutions and so forth to make his skin appear as if he is still alive. Some of you are kind of shaking your shoulders, creeped out a little bit. You may still be able to go and see his body, but he is no more alive than the pew that you're sitting on. And his kingdom is no more the kingdom that it was back then than many of the other kingdoms that have come and gone in our world. Is Russia the same Russia that it was in 1924? Not even a shadow of that. As much as they may have tried by preserving him, at least to sight, they could do nothing to make him nor his kingdom eternal. But in Jesus Christ, the king is dead, but long live the king, as David prayed, and long live the king's kingdom. One last verse that we want to look at here, Psalm 145 now. Psalm 145. And we want to look at verses 8 through 13. Psalm 145, page 621, 622. And we'll read verses 8 through 13. Psalm 145, beginning in verse 8, and I love the way this passage begins here. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. Is that your king today? It is, isn't it? And is that good news? Yeah. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that he has made. All of you have made, all you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your saints will extol you. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. And then notice verse 13, your kingdom is what kind of a kingdom? An everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful to all of his promises and loving toward all he has made. Jesus' kingdom is what kind of a kingdom? An everlasting kingdom. An eternal kingdom, one that will never, ever end. And we don't have to go look at some body that is semi-sort of decaying, but semi-sort of not of, after 90-some years, we have a Jesus who is truly what today? He is alive. And that was the message in Peter's sermon that we read in our scripture reading, that this Jesus you have crucified, he isn't dead anymore. This is the king that has been promised from the very beginning, the king that will never end, the kingdom that will never end. This is your king, Jesus Christ. And the people were pierced to the heart and they said, what must we do? Repent and what? Be saved. Repent and be baptized and be saved. One last quotation here from Barnes's notes on the New Testament. He shall reign among his people on earth until the end of time and be their king in heaven forever. His is the only kingdom that shall never end. He the only king that shall never lay aside his diadem and robes and shall never die. He, the only king that can defend us from all of our enemies, sustain us in death and reward us in eternity. And then listen very carefully to this last part. How important then to have interest in whose kingdom? His kingdom. 
How important is it today for us to have interest in His kingdom? How important then to have interest in His kingdom and how unimportant compared with His favor is the favor of all earthly monarchs? Where do we put our hope and our trust? In Jesus and His eternal kingdom. I don't care how many promises you bought from last Monday night's debate. It's not going to last, and they won't be able to do everything they said they're going to do. There's only one leader that we want to devote our interest in, and that's Christ Jesus. This past Sunday, Arnold Palmer, a golfer called the King, passed away. There have been others who have been called kings, such as Elvis, even though we don't know if he's really dead or not, right? But one of these days, that rumor's got to quit because he, it just can only go so long in reality. And there have been several real kings from the time of David all the way through 1622 when Charles VI gave over his reign at death to Charles VII and it was said, the king is dead and long live the king. None of that has lasted, nor will it continue to last. At best, it will be a legacy that is remembered in a history book for a period of time. And if you believe what you hear about our history books today, maybe not that much longer, right? But there is one king and kingdom that will last forever. And that king is your king and my king. He is King Jesus. And today, our cry out to Him, long live the King.